thank you very much, um, and thank you for um, having me to speak today. So, um, as I was uh, introduced, I'm Fiona Allen. I work at the Natural History Museum, part of um, David Rollinson's group, and Aidan Emery, um, who's in charge of the Schistomyces collections at the Natural History Museum, which I mentioned previously, should anyone have any samples they want to donate. Um, so, the title of my talk is Monitoring the Transmission of Schisto Using the Intermediate Snail Host. Um, so, just as an outline, um, as been highlighted in several talks already by Bonnie and others, um, as we're moving from morbidity control to elimination with the, with the declaration deadlines of 2025 in place, um, we really need, as we're at a diagnostics meeting, need tools and diagnostics to help um, sort of move into that new setting. So first we must ask ourselves really, where is transmission occurring? Um, what species of snails are involved? Which species of schistosome are endemic in areas? And is there any interaction between those species? So there has been some touches on uh, zoonoses and also hybridization between schistosome species. So secondly, we want to be asking how useful can the snail measuring, uh, measurements of snail infection be for use for other things within um, these control programs and predicting maybe the usefulness of the MDA and if it's working in a particular area. Um, and also looking at potential hotspots where there may be as high prevalence after many rounds of treatment or persistent areas or that there's something strange going on within the human population and their prevalence of infection. And um, are the methods of current parasite detection adequate for monitoring the interruption of transmission? So as Bonnie was talking on the kind of human side of things, do we actually need highly sensitive tests, maybe external from, um, from the human population? And is this an efficient use of money and resources in comparison to trying to screen thousands of people as those prevalence of infections drop to very low levels and with the problems with potential diagnostics within human disease um, diagnosis. Um, and also, um, can snail control also eliminate? So it's adding different tools rather than just using the drugs. So um, just to highlight the area of the life cycle that I'm interested in here. So it's from the egg hatching, so myricidium, through, does this? Ah, sorry. It worked too well. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's fine. I thought it was a pointer. So it's from the myricidium. So when that penetrates through into the production of Sakari. So it's that period that we, are, we define as the pre-patent period. So that could be a four to six week period depending on the species of schistosome and the species of snail, along with other environmental factors such as temperature, etc. So first you need to find the snails. So we'll do, generally we'll do a standard snail survey. This would be scooping for snails in areas where we think might be transmission areas through local knowledge, maybe community workers, teachers, where children are playing. And here we dredge or scoop um, looking for snails, take the water chemistry, identify all the snail species at least to genus level, and transfer those which could potentially be harboring schistosomes back to the lab, so Belinus um, for urogenital schistomyces and biroflaria for um, intestinal schistomyces. So then we would induce sicarial shedding to see if there's a patent infection and, um, and fix these snails for further molecular analysis. So then next step, identify those snails. So we can look at the morphology, which to a certain extent is useful, but some characteristics aren't um, for identification purposes from the shell shapes, 
can be tricky um, and they can be unreliable and inconsistent. Often in um, field environments, then they're quite plastic characters. So um, it's important to also look at what's happening on a molecular level. And we use sort of standard bar one um, barcoding of um, cytochrome oxidase one, which which gives you an idea of which species group something's in on which species they are. So, <coughs> sorry. Excuse me. Um, so the next thing that we're looking at is the detection of the parasite. So we've already seen if the snail shedding or not by looking using microscopy, but there's also other techniques that can be used to see if the infection is maybe within the snail but is not active at that time. So it's either pre-patent, post-patent, or it's been uh, penetrated, but it's never going to develop within the snail. So various methods have been used. So crushing the snail, looking for sporosis using a microscope. This can be tricky and time consuming. It's done a lot um, with the Asian species because the snails generally are quite a lot smaller and they're amphibious and easier to squash together. Um, also, you could do isoenzyme analysis. Um, what's been coming up recently is using PCR um, to detect the parasite within the snail. So as Bonnie mentioned, she used um, dry one for her RPA tests. Um, I've used this extensively on, on snails to look for hematobium group species. Um, and for Mansoni, there's another repeat which is similar, which is the SM17, which is of similar sort of quantity of the genome is this tandemly repeated uh, fragment. We've also used um, 28S, ITS, qPCR, and also LAMP has been used with these similar techniques. Um, so as I said, draw one is 121 tandemly repeated um, base pair fragment. Field studies have been carried out by Hamburger et al. and his group, uh, and Abassi in Kenya. And we replicated these in, or went a step further with these studies in Zanzibar, um, which was part of my PhD, um, and looked at long-term, um, longitudinal stale surveys, so from five potential transmission sites over um, a three-year period, looking for patent infections and then um, looking for pre-patent infections across all those snails. So um, this is just to highlight um, the difference of the amount of snails that are actually getting penetrated by the parasite than are actually shedding actively at one point in time. So generally, in a field environment with any schisto snail pairing, you're likely to find between 1 and 5% of those snails shedding. So here, it's just showing the, the blue line across the bottom is those snails that were actually shedding. So the peak of shedding was at 40%. But still at that time, the pre peak of pre-patent infection that we found within this collection, this is just from one site, it's a high transmission area, uh, we found up to 100% over this three-year period. So it's just showing you how much infection is actually, or contamination of the water is actually occurring at one time. So to take this a step further, we used this technique. So within the lab, we saw that we could detect it within 24 hours of the snail having been penetrated even by a single myricidium, so a highly sensitive test. So we thought, well, what's happening in an actual transmission area? So we deployed snail cages. So these are homemade cages made out of drain pipe and, and mesh and put the snails in the water for 24 to 72 hours um, upstream and downstream of transmission sites. So there were two sites used, um, Tinga Tinga, which is also a high prevalence site, high transmission site, and also Chani again, and I'll come on to that next. So using the PCR, um, we fixed the snails after 22, uh, 24 or 72 hours. And using PCR, we got after 24 hours, 17% of those had been penetrated. And this is across um, five sites. So there was a, out of 165 snails. And after 72 hours, this was up to 23%. So massively high amount of contamination in certain areas. 
this is just to give you an uh, idea. So this is Charney again, where you saw the pre-patent ones before. So where the, where the road crosses, the me that's the main road through the middle. There's a school there, and it's something that we've been monitoring for many years. The transmission is generally high in this area. So you can see at the source of the stream, from the snails that we collected there, and also the snails that I put in cages there, then there was very, there was nothing um, picking up, basically. And as you move towards the transmission site, then, then the number of snails infected within, a, within 24 hours is actually quite high. So again, similar to the Tinga Tinga, so things are getting infected up to 17% there. So moving on to more recent work, so this is looking at S. mansoni now, so intestinal schistomyosis. We're looking at, again, 121 base pair repeat. This was looked at by Hamburger and his group, and also Pontes um, in 2002. Lab experiments found what we expected. So if you can see on there, then there's, it's a bit smeary, but there's a laddered band. Um, so that's from snails that were positive. However, the problem with this is, with specificity, we did testing with other um, non-schistosome sicari that we'd got from um, Lake Victoria from other studies, from snail shedding, all sorts of stuff. And it, it appears here, so if you look in lanes two and three, then there's banding that, isn't, that shouldn't be there. So that's non-schistosome sicari. And in eight and nine is from um, hematobium. So there is cross-reactivity with other things in the water. Therefore, this kind of ruled out um, what was going on here. So there were several different species, but the, the majority of them um, were those two there. So we moved on looking through the literature just to see if there was anything else that we could use. So we came across Sandoval at AL 2006, who were looking at 28S region of S. mansoni, but um, this they'd only used it on human samples. So we checked it with Sicari, with worms, um, and also uninfected snails didn't amplify, so there was no cross-reactivity there. And also we checked it with the hematobium group, Sicari, as well as the ones we tried the SM174, and it didn't amplify. So this was a really good start because it's, it's specific enough to use. We tested it after 24 hours, and it picked those up. Um, an ability to detect for what we saw as low as um, 1.84 picograms um, from the adult worm. Um, and the assay was also, this is something that Bonnie touched on earlier again, it's about pooling samples. So we pooled samples with uninfected snails, more uninfected snails, and replicated this numerous times and found that you could detect one in 10. Um, and other studies have since shown, using different techniques, that you can increase that even higher. So then we went to test this on actual um, wild-caught snails. So this was part of the score um, snail study in Tanzania, so on Lake Victoria, and the samples we used were from Nyamahona, and these were used to show field application, basically. So these had been collected and, and fixed. We knew their infection status previously from shedding um, at the field site. So 10 of the samples we knew were shedding S. mansoni, and they produced positive results. The assay then detected a uh, an additional 16 samples, which meant that in total, 44% um, of the snails that we tested in this in this small group were infected, um, which is showing kind of double the percentage um, that you're getting just from sicarial shedding. So it appears to be on this small scale study um, an effective method. So the next steps um, is to further develop this molecular toolkit. So this is the, just a schematic of the process. So extract from the whole snail or extract from portions of, the reason we're extracting from the whole snail is you don't quite know where the parasite is going to be residing within the snail. And therefore, you have to go for a lot of tissue. There's a lot of inhibitors in snails as well. So you need to kind of um, potentially dilute your um, GDNA down. 
And so here also then, yeah, we pulled the samples so you can put that into a single PCR and do a single extraction of digested material. And this in, is enabling us to detect prepatent or penetrated snails. Um, however, the things that we do have to consider is, as I was saying before, it could be post-patent, it could be it could have been penetrated but not actually go on to develop a, a real infection. Um, and this is just a schematic to show that, that the Mercidia goes in, you may or may not get Sakari out, and that highlights the need for, for more work on compatibility in, in small um, geographical areas. So just in conclusion, um, the prevalence of prepatent infection in snails is massively higher than patent infections. I displayed it for hematobium on Zanzibar, so that was very extreme difference in, in the results. Slightly lower in the um, Tanzania study, but again, it was on a sm smaller scale. Um, molecular techniques can give a clearer picture of what's going on with local transmission. And it's a patchy disease, so in some areas you may not have that transmission. And as we move towards trans uh, elimination, then we need to know that we're targeting the right areas with MDA, so drugs aren't wasted, and potentially with snail control. And again, so that molluscicide is being used focally and where transmission is actually occurring. And again, this highlights the need for sensitive tools as possible. And also, the biology of the snail is really critical with this. Again, with the, you can get things infected, things in one area and not in another. So it's really important that you know what you're looking at. Um, and also the use of targeting this with chemotherapy and also um, looking at seasonal elements because transmission may be occurring at different times throughout the year. And more specific and simple tests for parasite detection to confirm interruption of transmission. The other thing that I'm very interested in as well is using new technologies such as um, NGS, et cetera, to look at the environmental DNA in these areas just to see if we can be detecting the parasites, if, they can, if we can find a test that's specific enough. But along with that also, can you just detect the snails in water body just by filtering a sample? So that's really something that we need to move forward. And um, just in exciting and breaking news, uh, yesterday the Biomifleria glabrata genome was published in Nature Communications. Um, Professor David Rollinson has been involved with this, and if you would like to read the paper, there's the link, and uh, you can also read about it um, on the NHM website. And I would like to thank um, SCAN, um, which is supported by the Wellcome Trust. I'd like to thank SCORE um, at, at UGA, um, also the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar and Nimri in um, Mwanza, along with the group at the NHM, the teams at Nimri and Ministry of Health. And I'd really like to thank uh, Rebecca Hoyle, who was my master's student last year, who did a lot of the development work on the S. Mansonized stuff. And thank you very much. <laughs>